Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, I'm Thiago, and today we're going to talk about spatial statistics. Well, mostly, I, I actually would like to spend a lot more time talking about some concepts behind biodiversity patterns. Those are the ones that really interest us. We are biologists, ecologists. Um, and so, um, for the logistics part, I have set up a server in my computer, and it's in this IP address. You can just type that in your browser, but wait, not yet. <laughs> if everybody does that at the same time, it's probably going to crash the network or my computer. So we start at should we start here, and then when you finish downloading, I think it's like six or, or seven files, when you finish downloading everything, then you tell your, uh, your mate on, the, on your left, and then we, we keep doing that until we finish. And there is no rush, because we're going to use the files in the afternoon, right? Um, and Rafael has tested for me, and it seems to be working like two minutes ago. All right. So what's the schedule for the day? Uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is a brief review of biodiversity patterns. It's a kind of uh, a review on community ecology and what are these patterns, uh, what are the uh, hypothesized causes for them, or the, the ecological mechanisms behind them. Then we're going to talk about some, some of these processes and how they could generate spatial patterns. Uh, then we're going to make a, uh, a distinction between what we call the point pattern and what we call the surface pattern spatial, spatial analysis. And it's a fundamental distinction to what we do uh, in terms of describing and measuring uh, spatial patterns. And then I'm going to spend a couple of slides on data formats for spatial analysis, analysis, because in the afternoon we're going to spend more time actually opening files and looking at them, make sure uh, we, we understand what formats the softwares uh, expect you to, to have. And then we're going to talk about spatial autocorrelation which is a fundamental concept in, in geographical analysis of, um, of ecological data. Then we're going to spend a little bit more time to uh, talk about how we can measure the amount of spatial autocorrelation or spatial structure in a given data set, how we can do that. Uh, we're going to talk about something called the Moran's Eye Index, and then we're going to talk about something called the spatial correlogram. And finally, we're going to talk about, if we have time, uh, about some local indicator of spatial autocorrelation, also called LISA. Mm, and by the way, uh, this entire presentation, as it, is, as it will be presented, is in the server. So I know if some of you are like me, like, like to take notes because it helps thinking, uh, please go ahead. But you don't really need to be nervous if you lose something. Like the presentation is there for you. And in the afternoon, we're going to play a little bit with this software called the Spatial Analysis in Microecology, the SAM software, uh, which I happen to be one of the developers. Well, I'm actually one of the developers, but I have co-authors. And SAM is available in this website. Uh, I hope most of you have already downloaded and installed it. Um, I'm going to show you some tricks and what, uh, what we can, how we can use this software to explore and to analyze spatial structure in data sets and most, most importantly, what it means from the ecological perspective or biodiversity perspective. And also, 
you, you can get this document, and it's a very long document. It's a, it, we call it the SAM tutorial. Uh, it's also available in the server. And it shows most of what SAM can do. So it goes way, way beyond this one day class. It's actually the tutorial that I use to teach this two weeks course, 60 hours course on spatial analysis. Um, and, and this day is a sh very short version of this full course on spatial analysis that I used to teach. Okay, these are my collaborators and co-authors in the SAM software. We need to acknowledge them. Uh, SAM is this, by now, it's almost 15 years uh, project, has been going for 15 years, and it's something that is always moving and it's dynamic. There, uh, uh, there's always analysis going in, analysis, some models going, going out. Um, if you want to read more about SAM, we have two papers published on, on it. Uh, you can get the references from the uh, tutorial. And I need to update this slide, but um, SAM has been used uh, all over the world, uh, uh, especially for, um, for research in, in ecological uh, uh, research in, in biodiversity and macro, macroecology, but it ranges from, uh, but it also ranges from like some kind of uh, uh, tooth disease. Someone published a paper using SEM to, un to understand some tooth disease, some random thing, and also what was, uh, there was someone using for mining something, like to completely out of the field. But so what I hope I can do today is to expand the num number of users uh, SAM has in Africa. I was really hoping for that. As you can see, uh, there are SAM users scattered all over the world, but they seem to be less frequent in Africa. So I hope I can fix that in my next map. All right, so first topic for the morning, a brief review on species richness patterns. Um, so as you know, biodiversity is not only counting species. There's a, there's a huge component and biodiversity spans like different concepts in ecology and it's a lot more than just counting species. But for the, for the exercise today, we're gonna simplify it and we're gonna study biodiversity from the perspective of only counting different species. Uh, more importantly, we're gonna count the number of species that lives in a single site. And this is what I mean by species richness. And as you may have heard, uh, uh, Counting species or biodiversity from the perspective of the number of uh, different species in a, sing in a single site or in a single moment in time, um, it's one of the most conspicuous uh, patterns we have in nature. Um, so uh, we ecologists or even uh, natural historians, they have been puzzled by the causes of species richness patterns for centuries for centuries, since the original Europeans started exploring uh, areas outside, um, outside Europe, first Africa and then South America, uh, they were always puzzled, especially, especially by tropical biodiversity. So this very, very important uh, uh, pattern we see in nature has roots that goes back millions of years. And we're gonna spend uh, uh, the next 15 minutes talking ab about what could have caused it, what maintains it, and how we can try to understand uh, the drivers of this 
the, of the patterns of, of species richness. Uh, the most conspicuous ones are the temporal pattern, the uh, insular pattern, the bathymetric pattern, the altitudinal one, and finally, the uh, latitudinal one. These are the most important uh, species richness patterns we have in nature. And there are also, well, scientists or researchers have uh, uh, have created and have been uh, doing research on several hypotheses and potential mechanisms that drive these patterns. And these hypotheses and mechanisms, they can be structured uh, from the most local scale or what causes the difference in species richness from here to the other side of this mountain and also in the regional or, or global scale, what causes the difference in species richness from here to South America? Okay, so the, uh, the temporal patterns are pretty uh, old. Um, if we look at the geological record, we can see that species richness vary a lot through time. Um, and when we go closely to the number of species uh, through time, we actually see uh, rapid increases in species richness and some very rapid falls, which we call the mass extinction events. So we are used to look at nature and think it's kind of static and that we can come back in a couple years and it's gonna be the same thing? Um, well, it's not true for any temporal scale. Uh, everything is dynamic and fluid and the larger the temporal scale you look, the more dynamic it becomes. So it's really important that we get that, uh, that we understand and we incorporate uh, in our analysis and the way we think, that everything we see in ecology, uh, all the patterns we see in ecology, they are not static. And it has been that way for millenniums, for millions of years, even long, long before we were here, we were around. So mass extinction events have set uh, a very strong pattern uh, in the geological record. We can, we can see that uh, quite easily looking at the fossil record. And also adaptive radiations, some of them in unexpected places, some of them in unpredictable uh, moments, also have uh, increased species richness or, or the biodiversity in, uh, and have created entire biotas and, and have designed and have uh, um, formed entire biotas that we see today. And, and of course they will not be there, these, these same species are most likely not be there in some millions of year for, years from now. So we have to incorporate the dynamic nature of biodiversity in how we think and how we apply ecological concepts. Um, another famous uh, biodiversity pattern um, is related to uh, insular, uh, to, to how islands are uh, positioned in space. And we know that species richness usually increase with geological age of the islands. So an older island usually tend to harbor more species, everything else being equal. Also, larger I islands are usually due the, the species richness in in larger islands is usually a consequence of lower extinction rates and higher immigration rates to that island. And 
Uh, the opposite is also true. Uh, smaller islands, usually uh, you, you will find more local extinctions in smaller islands and less immigration to that island. So these, these two process, immigration and local extinction, has been, have been uh, formalized in a single model and this model we call, what's the name of this model? Anyone? No? I'm gonna let you think a little and maybe go back to this later. So species richness usually tend to increase uh, no, extinction tend to increase uh, when the island is, is smaller than, lar than, than a very large uh, island. And immigration tends to increase when the island is closer to a mainland or a source of immigrants. When the island becomes far, uh, the, the immigration becomes less intense. Um, so, isolation, uh, extinction, immigration, island size, these are all related to, uh, to the species richness we find in a single island. Um, of course, there is also the bathymetric gradient and it is very common to find a strong decrease in species richness as you go deeper uh, in, in water. And the main reason for that is the incidence of solar radiation or, or light. So the deeper you get, the less light you have and usually more primary productivity you have. And because of that, you're going to have less plants. And when you have less produce producers, you're probably going to have less herbivores and less carnivores. So the deeper you get, uh, the less species richness you get. Of course, temperature is also uh, correlated with solar incidence. And when you have less temperature, you usually have less energy in your environment. And when you have less energy, you usually find a correlation with species richness. Uh, colder places usually harbor less species. Uh, another very important and well-studied uh, gradient is the altitudinal gradient. The altitudinal gradient uh, according to the, or, or, or this gradient is related to the decrease in species richness as you go up in a mountain and it's also really conspicuous. Um, higher mountains usually harbor a lot less species on their top than, than they do in their bottom, right? So this is, this is what we call the altitudinal gradients in species richness. So richness tends to decrease with altitude. Uh, the main uh, reason for that, or at least ecologists like to, or ecologists and biogeographers like to think it is, it's temperature. As you go up in a mountain, it usually gets colder and colder. And that may be related to the number of species that can tolerate uh, that temperature. Also, uh, when we have this very nice conic mountain, of course you have less area on top than you have in the bottom. So because there's less area on the top, you usually expect a strong correlation between species richness and area. <coughs> 